Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Can people at the top hear me? OK, great. Thank you. On Wednesday, we talked about probability space. And inside this probability space, we have three elements. The sample space, which is the set that contains all the possible outcomes. OK, if you throw a die, you get one through six. So it is a set of all the possible outcomes. And then inside this sample space, we have a little bit difficult set. It's called the event space. Inside this event space, we have a lot and lot of subsets that can be formed in a sample space. So if you look at this diagram, this is page 20 uh, of the slide. You can see that the sample space contains all these small little colored dots. And then in the event space, you have all the combinations of the colored dots. And you can have one dot, two dots, no, uh, three dots, and so on. So you have all the combinations of possible events. In the end of the last lecture, someone came and asked, uh, what, is the, what is the relationship between the event space and the power set? Is the power set the same as the uh, event space? Um, now, for those of you who know what the power set means, it's just the enumeration of the, all the possible combinations of, of, of outcomes. Uh, for discrete uh, sample space, um, the event space is exactly the same as the power set. And so you have two to the power in uh, uh, events that can be formed in a set that contains n elements. However, for continuous sample space, then the definition of the event space may be a little bit different from the uh, power set. Okay, so we're not going to go into details of that, but I just want to point out that if you're looking at a finite and it's a discrete sample space, then yes, uh, the power set is the same as the event space. Now, we have understood the, the definition of a sample space. We also understood the, the definition of the event space. Then today we want to talk about this probability law. This probability law is a mapping. It is a function, okay, it's a mapping, that takes an event and it's going to assign you a number. For example, after I die, I ask, uh, what is the probability of getting the even numbers? Now, of course, even numbers is a subset inside my sample space. This is an event. I'm going to assign a number to this event. And clearly, in this case, it will be one half because uh, even numbers, uh, it will be two, four, and six out of six uh, outcomes, so it will be a uh, uh, half. Uh, but that is assignment. This, this is an assignment that I define according to the law. And there are different restrictions of a law. You cannot just arbitrarily assign a number. There are, there are criteria uh, for the probability law to make sense. So we want to talk about that. So what is a probability uh, law? Probability law, of course, is a mapping. It's a mapping from something to something. But before we go in there, let me just remind you what is a probability. Probability is a measure of the size of a set. Okay, let me just repeat again. What is probability? Probability is a measure of the size, how big is the event relative to your sample space. Right, so you, you're talking about measuring the size of an event. Um, so when we talk about measure, there is a little notion of what is the size. So this is page 16. The, the notion of size uh, is very, very relative. You need to tell me what is the ruler that you're using to measure the size of a set. For discrete numbers, the, the natural ruler will be counting. Uh, one through three, four, five, I'm just counting. So every count will give me a, a mass, and then I'm counting how how much mass are there. Okay, so uh, probability would be the, uh, the sum of the values or sum of the numbers, which is accounting. Now, if you go to talk about a 1D interval time, okay, 
what is the probability of, uh, of a bus coming to West Lafayette when you give me a time interval between 10 to 20 minutes. So that's a time. Uh, in this case, the, the interval has to be measured by the length. Okay, it has to be measured by the length of that interval. So that goes to a very tricky question. What is the probability of getting 1.5 over that interval of 0 to 2? That's a little bit tricky, right? So, so now I'll give you an interval, 0 to 2. There's a continuous interval. I'm asking what is the probability of getting a point called 1.5. Now that probability is 0. Okay? That probability is 0 because you're talking about one point, however, your ruler, your ruler is measuring the length. Your ruler is measuring the length of a set. And that one point has a length of zero. If you take the integration, right, whenever you talk about uh, a length, you talk about integration, the integration of a point is zero. Right? So that, that's a little bit counterintuitive. If you think about, wait, 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 okay, a, a point, I just count, yeah, if you count them, Okay, if, if the ruler that you're using is a counter, then it will give you some mass. It will give you a non-zero mass. But then if you use a ruler to measure the length, then a single point will give you a zero probability. Same for area. If, if I'm looking at uh, events that are defined by the area, then my ruler or the measure has to be a 2D integral that can actually calculate the area relative to the, the, the sample space. So again, if I give you a coordinate, I ask what is the probability of getting that coordinate, that will be zero. And there are many, many of these uh, uh, events, we call them uh, a measure zero uh, event. So what are they? Um, one way to think about probability is to define it as uh, the size of this event E over the size of uh, omega. And so if you are, you're asking what is the probability of getting a single point x zero, that is going to be zero if you're using a, a ruler. Okay. Um, so here are a few examples. Let's say your sample space is zero and one. That's an interval, that's a closed interval. That's a closed interval. We ask what is the, what is the probability of getting this subset? Now, this subset is very interesting. It only has one number. This subset has a measure of zero. Okay? So the probability is zero. Now, if I change the game to one through three, four, five, six, I'm still looking at one point. Then I ask, what is the probability of getting this one? Well, that would be one over six because there is a natural counter, a natural measure for this sample space, which is a counter. So now if you have an interval, which is a closed interval on A and B, including A and B, that is going to be the same as you're measuring the length of this open interval of A and B. In other words, the set that contains only the point A or only the point B, you have a probability of zero. Okay? So, so, so that is a, a little bit difference between how you think about probability? Well, we used to think about probability associating them with, with throwing a die, flipping a coin, those are discrete events. In those cases, every point you have a mass, you have a probability value. But if you start to think about continuous domain, then each single point, you may not have a, a, a probability. It will be zero probability. And you can have a lot and lot of these events. So why do we care about these? Uh, it's because there are lots of measure zero events in our lives, okay? Uh, so what I mean is that uh, as you are doing machine learning, you try to evaluate the performance of your algorithm, uh, you can sort of ignore all these measure zero events. Uh, the probability of, for them to happen is zero, so you can ignore them. If you want, want to calculate the probability for those, uh, 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 if they don't have a chance of happening, you don't even need to worry about them. And there are lots and lots of these cases. Okay? So especially for the limiting numbers, uh, you've said you're talking about their limits. Uh, in many situations, you can ignore that. So that is going to um, make your life a little bit easier. There's a formal definition called almost sure um, um, events. 
uh, in event A is said to be almost sure if the probability of, of getting this A is one, excluding for all the measure zero sets. So when I say that uh, this thing has a probability of one, almost surely happens, uh, I'm, I'm, there's an implicit thing that is behind it, which is that I'm excluding all these measure zero events. Okay? So, so it's not guaranteed to be, it is not deterministically one. Because if you want to be deterministic to one, you also need to take care of everything. But now I'm only taking care of everything except those measure zero subsets. Now this is a little bit abstract. We do not need that in this course, but I want to bring it up early uh, in this stage because I don't know how many of you would want to go to graduate school, you want to do a theory on uh, measure theory and you want to do a machine learning theory. Then in that case, you may want to go back to these materials. At least you know this terminology. As you read papers, as you read uh, articles, you may have a little bit idea what does this measure zero mean? What does this almost surely mean, right? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit meaning here. Not that difficult, but it will be quite to think through that. Okay, so now uh, we have talked about this um, measure zero, so then we can go back and talk about this probability um, law. This is the probability law. So I'm gonna talk about there are a few rules that you need to follow in order to define the probability law. It's not an arbitrary mapping from an event to a number. So that goes to um, uh, lecture 2.3, okay? So that's also the textbook 2.3. Axioms of probability. So what is, uh, what is an axiom? Axioms are things or their statements uh, that we have to agree on. If you don't agree with me on the axioms, uh, there's nothing that we can negotiate. So you've got, to follow, you've got to agree with me on these axioms. If tomorrow morning you can come up with another set of axioms, uh, it has to be logically consistent, and then we can all define the probability based on the axioms that you define. Now your axiom has to be complete, has to be consistent. Now complete means that everything has to follow from your axiom. Um, so uh, many, many years ago, uh, almost a century ago, um, people defined this set of axioms. Um, there are three axioms that we will need for this course. Uh, a probability law is a function, uh, P, that takes uh, any events from this event space. It's gonna map it to a number between zero and one, including zero and one. Uh, and this function has to satisfy three axioms, known, known as the probability axioms. There are three of them. The first one is called a non-negativity axiom. Uh, this axiom says that whatever you do with this mapping, you got to make sure that when you take any event, A, uh, you take this probability, it has to be bigger than or equal to zero. This is, this is kind of, uh, it looks obvious, right? You, you, you measure the size of uh, an event, it got to be bigger than zero. Or equals to zero, you can have measure zero sets. Right, okay, so, so that seems uh, pretty, pretty um, obvious. We need that. If you don't even have that, you will run into trouble. Okay, normalization is also a very obvious thing. That if you measure the size of the sample space, it got to be one. Now, you got to agree with me. If you say that, I, I just don't agree with you on that, uh, then there's no discussion we can have because all the probabilities are based on uh, these axioms. And it makes sense. Uh, you take the sample space, you measure the size, it gotta be one. Oh, why not 100? Why, gotta be, why it has to be one? That's for convenience. If you define uh, this normalization to be 100, and if other people agree with you, it's okay. All right, it's just that people uh, uh, tend to uh, agree on this number one. So that's the uh, uh, that's normalization, uh, normalization law. Okay, the third one is a, is, is a big one. Uh, it's called the additivity law. This is the big one, okay? Um, so if you have a s sequence of subsets, A1 through A infinity, you have many of these subsets, and suppose that they are all disjoint this joint means that you take the intersection of two, uh, 
uh, you, you, you look at the overlap, they don't have overlaps. Okay, they're all, they all separated. Then uh, you, uh, you look at the union of everyone. And so this notation means that I'm taking the union of all these individual subsets. And then I take the union from one to infinity, I'm taking care of everyone. The probability of this union has to be the sum of the individual probabilities. Uh, uh, how do we interpret that? So let me, let me draw a picture and then we'll come back to this point. This equation has infinite union, but let me start with a simple case of just two sets. Okay, A and B, just A and B. Then uh, the left hand side would be uh, the union of A and B, the right hand side would be a, uh, uh, the probability of A plus the probability of B. Right? So the, that, that, is the, that is a special case of this additivity law. Um, so let's draw the picture. The picture says that if, I'm, if I have these two uh, sets, A and B, they are disjoint, then clearly you need to make sure that they are disjoint, they, they, they are not overlapping, so you have A and B. And then I'm trying to measure the size of the set called A union B. I'm measuring the size called A union B. What is A union B? A union B is them. Okay, I'm very careful. It is, it's not the sum of or whatever, it's them. Simultaneously, you have these two sets, they appear together, and that's called the A union B. Right? Don't, don't think about add addition. Don't think about addition because I'm going to define addition on the right hand side. Here on the left hand side, just they appear simultaneously. Boop, they pop up. Okay? They're, they're, they're there. Now you're measuring the size of this pair of sets relative to the size of this uh, big square. That is called the A union B. The axiom says, previously, uh, you can just calculate the size of the circle at the size of this uh, ellipse. That's the right-hand side. Uh, but, but that's different, that's different, right? So the left-hand side equals the right-hand side, that is, that's defined by the axiom. Now, you can, you can defeat this axiom and say, ah, I just don't like this axiom. You can come up with uh, other situations to, de to de say that I want to use a different axiom. Now, if you don't agree on this axiom, a lot of things will not follow. This is very, very fundamental. You need to have this axiom. Now, you say, why do I um, need to have this addition? Uh, what if they, they overlap? Well, if they overlap, then you probably shouldn't have this addition. Okay? Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, here, uh, let's say you are throwing a die. You're throwing a die. This is a set of, uh, uh, let's say, one. Okay? This is a set of two and three. They don't overlap, and therefore I ask what is the probability of getting the first set that contains only one, the second set that contains two and three, and you know the union will be one and two and three. Uh, and so uh, and then in your mind you can just calculate, all right, the probability of getting a one is one six, the probability of getting two and three will be two six, and so uh, the, the, the overall probability according to uh, this calculation Summation, it will be 1 over 6 plus 2 over 6, it will be 3 over 6. Right, so you have already done that. But on the other hand, you, sh you can also think about that, all right, what is, the, what is the union? The union will be the set that contains 1 and 2 and 3. So that's 2 over 6. And this is like the very trivial thing, right? It's, it's so trivial that you, you, will, you will just immediately tell me, okay, 3 over 6. You wouldn't even try to think about the relationship between these two. But I'm telling you that, this, this unconscious thinking is part of this axiom. It's part of this axiom, and you've got to agree on this axiom. All right, so now with these three axioms, oh, by the way, the axiom says that you, you, can, you can do this operation um, uh, for all the countable uh, uh, sets inside, inside heap. Okay? I'm not just limiting myself to two. I can have three or four and so on. Um, so with these three axioms, I can actually do a lot of things. So let me give you uh, a couple uh, statements that you would feel like they are all very trivial, um, but they can be all proven from these three axioms. Okay? 
uh, just to illustrate how powerful the axioms are. Okay, so let's do this exercise. I have about six corollaries. I claim that each one can be proven from the three axioms. Okay, and let's do that. Let's look at the first one. You have a set A, and then you are looking at A complement. I claim that the probability of getting an A complement is 1 minus the probability of A. Hmm, how do we prove that? You can draw a figure. Yes, please. Okay, okay, we have a great suggestion here. So let's do that. Can you guys hear? Okay, so we can, we can take the union of A and A complement. So let's see what do we have. The probability of A union A complement. Okay, A union A complement. Uh, what do we get? we have here? A union A complement. Yes. It will just be omega. What is P omega? One. Uh, wh where does this one come from? Assume two. By the way, why is it equal to omega? Where does this come from? This equality. Now that's not the axiom. This is not the axiom. Okay, this is not the axiom. This is just the set theory. Okay, so this is this is a set. Okay, so this is a set theory. Uh, set, the set theory says that you you have a, a and a complement. If you take the union, you, it's going to give you the uh, omega. So that's the definition of of complement. So that is not the axiom. Uh, axiom will give you one. Okay. Uh, that is not enough for me to calculate uh, this uh, one minus a. So what should I do here? I should apply axiom, right? Yes. Yes, so here we can write it as PA plus P of AC. This is axiom three. Uh, wait a minute, there's a criteria for axiom three. There's a condition, what is the condition? Disjoint, are they disjoint? They are disjoint, A and A complement, they're disjoint, and therefore you can apply axiom three to get this. Okay, so then you, you, you link this with that, you have probability of A complement equals to 1 minus probability of A. Okay, so everything is proven by the axiom or the set theory. Now, of course, if you want, you can draw a picture. A, this is A, uh, A complement is outside, of course, it's 1 minus the, the, the size of A. Right? So that's very intuitive. You just draw a picture, you, you're talking about size, right? Size, here it will be area, so you got, sort of got the idea. Okay, so now, now let's look at the, the second one. You have a subset A inside the omega, and then you say that the probability of getting an A is less than or equals to 1. Why is that true? That got to be true because it's a, it's a subset inside the omega. Is trivial, but but how do we prove that again using the axiom? Ah, how do we use the axiom to prove it? Any thought? Yes. Okay, okay. So, uh, excellent point, thank you, okay. So we can, we can go back to this statement, the statement of number one. The statement of number one says the probability of A equals to one minus the probability of A complement. Let's just uh, flip around the, the, the A and the A complement. Um, and then, uh, what do I have? Well, I know this is going to be positive. By axiom 
one. This is positive, okay? Regardless of what I have, this is a set inside the sample space. If I measure it, it got to be bigger than or equal to zero by axiom one. So when you look at this equality again, you have something equals to one minus something that is positive. One minus something that is positive. Now, of course, this has to be less than one. Does that make sense? You're subtracting some positive things. Okay, so now let's move on to the third one. The probability of an empty set is zero. Isn't it, again, trivial? Uh, I have a set that doesn't contain anything. Of course, I may, when I measured it, I wouldn't get anything out. But how do I prove it? One line. Yes. Uh -huh. Yep. Yep. Yep, yep, I think you guys are getting it, okay? It's, it's, it's the same set of uh, approaches, right? So you have probability of um, uh, empty set. So that is going to be, um, you can start with omega, and then you can take a union of the empty set. That is going to uh, remain as uh, omega, right? Because you're taking the union of an empty set with this universal set. Oh, in fact, when you have an empty set, your union with any set is going to become the, the set itself. So that's going to hold. Um, this is one. And then uh, omega and empty sets, they are disjoint. And so I would have probability of omega plus the probability of the empty set. All right, so then I have this equality, and this is one, according to axiom number two. And so this is one, this is one, of course this has to be zero. We can prove. Right, you see that this is pretty interesting, right? So I give you the three axioms, uh, all these uh, very simple, interesting properties. You can, you can all prove them through the axioms. It's not that difficult. All right, so the fourth one is, uh, is a, little bit, a little bit harder, not too hard. Uh, so you can, you can look at this A union B. And uh, on the left, on the right hand side, you have a probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intercept B. How is it different from the axiom number three? Yes. Okay, great. So this is a more general form than the axiom. The axiom only says that if A and B are disjoint, then you have thus. But here, since we don't state that A and B are disjoint, you will have another term. It's a special case when A and B are disjoint, then A intercept B has to be an empty set, so that will give you zero. Why do I get zero? Well, according to this corollary number three, which you can always, again, trace back and then to, the, to the axiom and prove that. All right, so how do we prove that? Well. Uh, intuitively, but just looking at the picture, I think we can, we can agree. What do we have? On the left-hand side, you have A union B, and well, it would just be uh, this region. Uh, okay, so it would be here. That would be your A union B. How do I get this A union B? You take the A, you plus the B, and then you subtract the A intercept B. You take the A, you take the B, well, and then the, the overlap is overlapped once. Okay, it's overlapped once. You take that overlapped, uh, then you will get this uh, A union B. So that's the pictorial illustration. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, how do we prove it? Haha, -ha, that, that is a little bit trickier. How, how do we prove that? Um, the proof of this thing uh, is also not that difficult. I can, I can show you. Once you understand this picture, the proof is <laughs> not hard. So what do we have? Uh, probability of A union B, right? Probability of A union B. But before we do that, let's just look at A union B. What is A union B? A union B has three parts. 
A union B equals to what? Uh, A, you don't want B, right? You want A, you don't want B. Um, and then you want A intercept B, which is the middle part. And then you want B, but you don't want A. Okay, so that's the other, other moon. So you have these three parts. This, this, and that. You agree with me? Okay, so these three sets. They are all disjoint. Is it okay? They're all disjoint. Okay, so now let's do this. If I take the probability of this guy, I'm going to take the probability of these two guys. They are all disjoint. Life is good, right? All disjoint, then by axiom number three, I will have probability of A, but I don't want B, plus the probability of A intercept B, plus the probability of B, but I don't want A. That is axiom number three. Um, but then what? Uh, well, uh, on the right-hand side, I want to have probability of A. How can I construct the probability of A? Well, I can do something here. I can, I can merge these two. Right? I can merge these two because they're disjoint by the uh, axiom again. Uh, I can just look at this. A but not B, union A intercept B. Well, this guy can do the same operation. I will have B not A. I'm going to union of A intercept B. But then I'm going to uh, subtract the probability of A intercept B. Now, how does this come along? You can always add a term called the probability of A intercept B and minus the probability of A intercept B. You can always add something in, subtract something. And this something can go along with uh, this B without A. Okay, so uh, basically I'm grouping these two terms together. I'm grouping these two terms together, and so I have one uh, a subtraction in term at the end. So on these three, and then I can look at this. This is just A without B union with, uh, with this uh, A intercept B. So if you look at this diagram, it would be this part add with this part. What do you get? You get A. You get probability of A. Are you guys following me? Okay, just draw this picture. You have this moon shape plus this overlapped region. That's going to give you back the A. So you have A, which is this one. And then this one will give you probability of B. And here you have minus of probability of A intercept B. So all the steps that I'm employing here, they're coming from the axioms. This is just the set theory, okay? A union B, I can write that as the, uh, uh, the, this union of disjoint subsets. This is set theory. This is uh, by axiom number three. Add a term minus a term, that's just algebraic trick. Uh, here it is the combining the union into the probability of, of, of A. So this equality is by axiom number three again, because I'm going from this addition back to this union. So that's, that's axiom number three. Going from here to this, this is just the set theory. Right? So you can see that it's all the set operations plus the, plus the axioms. Put them together, you can actually prove uh, the statement. Does it make sense to you? Okay. All right, so this is uh, another property. Um, any questions? All right, so let's move on. Uh, the fifth one is another very easy um, um, brainstorming exercise. A union B got to be less than or equals to A plus uh, B. That's actually a name. That's called a union bar. Uh, how do you prove that? Pretty easy, right? Now you have the previous one. We can start with the previous one. Probability of A union B equals to probability of A 
plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intercept B. How can I move from this previous corollary to here? Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. So this guy is bigger than or equal to zero. It is it's giving you a zero when A and B are disjoint. If they're disjoint, you can get back the, uh, the equality. And so this is SM number three. But if they are uh, overlapping, then, then, then you will have a, a, a positive number. Then you have a sum subtracting a positive number. Of course, it has to be less than uh, the sum without the, without the subtraction. That's called a union bound. A union bound is actually pretty powerful. Uh, it's not a very, very, very tight band, but it's very easy to use. So uh, if you have a chance to uh, study further about um, some learning theories, uh, you try to prove the, um, uh, one of the more, more uh, classical results uh, is the Huffing inequality. And you try to prove that something is probably uh, uh, approximately correct PAC uh, framework, uh, you're going to use this union bound. So, so it, is, it is something that will be used. It's not just a statement that, ah, uh, we prove for the sake of proving, but it is something that we're going to use. Not for this class, but for, uh, for other classes. So the union bounds here. Uh, this one uh, is more uh, uh, logical thinking. It, it's pretty easy to see if you draw a picture. So if A is a subset of B, then A has to be less than or equals to a B. Does that make sense? Intuitively, does it make sense? Okay, if you're not following, just think about what is probability. Probability is the measure of the size of an event. If I have an event that is a smaller event of the other bigger events, then the size of this has to be less than the size of the other. It cannot be bigger. It, it, it's, just, it's just that. That, that, that logic, right? So you have this uh, a B, you have this A, A is inside a B, then the size of A has to be uh, less than the size of a B. Okay. So here's an example. Uh, you have this set A uh, and set B, then clearly A has to be less than B, right? Because A, uh, a is any number is less than 5, B is any number less than 10. Uh, I assume that the the omega is uh, between uh, 0 and, and, and 10, and so that it is, it is bound up below. Uh, in that case, uh, you, can, you can see that uh, very obviously, there's a smaller uh, set, and of course, the probability has to be small. OK, uh, shall we move on and talk about some examples? So let's do this example, it's, uh, not too hard. You have events A and B where uh, the probability of getting A is X, the probability of getting B is Y, and you are given the probability of A union B, that is Z. Uh, we want to find the following probabilities. A intercept B, A complement, intercept B complement, there's the next page. So let's do this page first. Uh, probability of uh, A intercept B. How do we do it? Yes. Uh, the, 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 the thinking process. Okay, excellent, excellent. So the suggestion is we look at probability of A union B, and that is equal to probability of A plus the probability of B uh, minus the probability of A intercept B. Uh, here, since the union is given by Z, this is X, this is Y, 
So we know uh, what is the probability of A intercept B, which is uh, probability of A intercept B if uh, X plus Y minus Z. So a reminder for you is that for this course, uh, the answer is not the most important thing. Um, so as you are working on your uh, exams later on the semester, uh, try to show your, your steps. Try to show your thinking. Uh, there will be a lot of partial credits for the correct thinking. Uh, if, you, if you jump in and say, uh, uh, probability uh, equals to zero. Uh, you, know, you know for this course, in many cases it will be zero. The answer will either be zero or one. Uh, many, many examples. So if you know the answer, just write down zero or one. Uh, but if you only write down zero or one, uh, we really cannot give you points because it's like a, like a, like a, like a gambling. That doesn't really make sense, right? So um, even if you don't know how to tackle the problem, you write down some steps. Write down some steps. Uh, you may not be able to uh, complete until the last step, but then perhaps the, uh, the first couple steps, they are the correct way of approaching the problem. Then we can, we can, we can give you a lot of partial credits. Just to keep that in mind, okay? Don't just focus on the answer, okay? Focus on how do we get to the answer. All right, so uh, that is part A. Now let's look at part B. Part B is A complement intersect with B complement. That's a little, yes, please. Okay, excellent. So let's use the Morgan's law. So the law says that you can look at probability of A and B. Now I have complement outside, so I can just do this union, and then I put the complement outside this union. So that's called the De Morgan's law. So one of the uh, properties of the set theory, so you go to uh, the last page of the set theory lecture, you can see this uh, identity. Okay? So uh, what is A union B? Well, A union B, I have already calculated. Uh, no, it's, it's here, it's Z, right? So this is Z. And what is this complement? This complement is just one minus the probability of A union B. And so since this is Z, I will have 1 minus Z. Okay. So you can calculate this uh, event. Is everyone okay? Pretty okay, right? It's not too hard. How about this example? You have probability of A complement union B complement. Hmm. Yes. The same, the Morgan's law, so this is probability of A intercept B, we take the complement, that's going to give you 1 minus the probability of A intercept B, and that's going to give you 1 minus, what do I have in the previous slide? This is uh, X plus Y minus Z. Okay, so this problem is solved. The last one. A intercept B complement. Now clearly, that's not the Morgan's law. And pay attention, there is no complement here. And if you apply the Morgan's law, you will get a very funny uh, convoluted result because uh, you, you flip it around, but then you have a complement for the A. That's not fun. Um, what do we do here? Yes. Okay, so we can draw the Venn diagram. Okay, so let, let's do that. Let's draw the Venn diagram. Now there is an A, there is a B, so let's call this A, let's call this B. Where is A intercept B complement? Yes. It's just A without the middle piece, okay? so. Let's just take a look. You want A, right? So what is A? A will be here. This is A. Uh, where is B? B is here, but you want everything outside is B. Everything outside B means here. 
so you're looking at the intersection. The intersection would be an area that has both the red and the black color, which is this. Or if you want me to draw it out, it would be this. Now we ask, what is the probability of that? Yes. Uh, that is equal to probability uh, one minus one minus. Oh, okay. Another one. Okay, probability of a minus the probability of uh, a intersection. Everyone happy with this? Okay, so you have probability of A, uh, which is this uh, entire circle, and then you minus uh, the, the, the intersection, that's, uh, that's uh, A intercept B. So A is X, uh, A intercept B is, I need to look at it, is uh, X plus Y, this is X plus Y minus Z. So uh, you take the calculation, it will be Z minus So uh, I hope this, uh, this exercise uh, gives you a pretty good um, a direction of how, how do we study these problems. Uh, now later on in our course, uh, you will see um, the, the problem will not be appear in this form. It will be certain event and then another event, some statement and another statement, and then you're going to take some complement, you're going to take some union and intersection, and then you'll be, you'll be asked to evaluate that probability. So uh, just make sure that you understand how do we do these operations, and then as the actual problem comes, then you will know how to map uh, from your actual word problem to uh, these, uh, the symbols, and then you can carry on the calculation. Okay, so um, that's, uh, that's the end of uh, this lecture. And um, Monday is Labor Day, so no class. Then uh, we resume our class on Wednesday, and then we will talk about the next uh, lecture so you can download, you can print them out. I'll see you next Wednesday. Thank you. <laughs>